You don't have to just do one thing. You can do multiple things and you just have to you know, hire well and hire a GM who could essentially take that off of your plate and then you can, you're free to kind of work on other stuff. You're limited on your growth because you're the yeah. one that has to do all the work. A lot of people think that you're, you start over when you switch industries, but in reality, you're actually compounding these experiences into things that you can leverage. Young So, welcome to the podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here, my man. Andreas, thanks so much for having me, man. I'm pumped for this conversation. Yeah, I'm pumped as well. Um, you definitely have had an interesting career and you fit the traditional e-com and, and those buckets that people hear about, but I don't think it's in the traditional ways. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into your journey and, and everything that you've accomplished. Um, I like to start right off the bat. You started your career at Ripple. How did you end up there and what drew you to crypto? Yeah, so, you know, I moved to San Francisco from New York City. I was, so I was in finance before my tech, I guess, career. Uh, so I, I, I left New York, bought a one-way ticket in 2011, end of 2011, so October. And I didn't have a place to stay or a job. And so I actually crashed on the floor of a friend's apartment in Berkeley, which is about an hour north of San Francisco. And uh, I was just like in saving mode, right? I was eating burritos. Every I mean, good thing is the burritos here are pretty good. So uh, <laughs> and they're pretty cheap. Um, but um, I was eating like burritos every day and just trying to get by. Um, and, you know, I was sleeping on an air mattress for months and it really like destroyed my back, um, at the time. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to move into a city to surround myself with people that I wanted to be with in the future. And so when I was in New York in finance, you know, I thought long and hard about like, all right, I'm in this career now, you know, I was a trader at a hedge fund, which is a pretty good job for most people. And, um, you know, my family thought I was crazy when I was told them I was moving across country, quitting my job during the Great Recession. But, um, you know, I visioned myself as someone that would be starting a company at some point. And I wanted to surround myself in that environment where it's like entrepreneurship is the norm. Entrepreneurship is what everyone talks about. And so the only way to do that was to move to the hub of entrepreneurship, which is Silicon Valley and San Francisco, right? So that's what I did. And, you know, when I moved here, I didn't know anybody, didn't have a job, like I said. And it was a really tough job, uh, tough time in the beginning. But um, I found a, a tech startup to work with. Um, you know, it was about three months after I arrived. So I found a job three months after. And it was actually not Ripple. It was another company that was doing mobile gaming, mobile advertising. And so I was doing analytics there because the only skill set that I had from trading that was applicable was more of this like Excel analysis stuff. And so um, I was in business development and I was essentially, I actually started off as an intern. So, you know, imagine like I've been working in finance for a few years. I come in and all these like software engineers who think they're big shots, they're like, oh, now we got this intern. And like, I was like getting them coffee. It was like just a, you know, it was just intern life, right? And so, um, yeah, and it was a, it was an interesting time. Um, but then I was able to get myself into those networks of people that I wanted to be around, and that was the most important thing for me. Was I made these connections during that time that, um, you know, I'm still like these connections are still important to me, and I re you know I hang out with these people still. I, I still live in San Francisco, so um, that was a really important thing. And then, like you mentioned, um, Ripple. So I, I left uh, this company to get into software engineering because I wanted to dive more into the actual building aspect of a startup or, or a company. And so I did this like crazy boot camp, uh, a software engineering accelerator. Uh, and this was about 13 weeks. So it's like a 13 week program. And like it's Monday through Saturday, like 8 a.m. till. 9 p.m. It's a crazy program. And essentially, you're getting a computer science degree in 13 weeks, right? So it's a really accelerated program. And at the end, they pretty much guarantee that you'll land a really good job, a software engineering job. 
And so I was lucky enough that Ripple came to recruit at the end of the program. And they saw that I had finance background and they were building a trading platform. And so they're like, I literally was on a trading desk using the software. And so the timing of it worked out really well where they're like, okay, you have trading background. You already had the finance. You worked on Wall Street. Like it just, and now you're doing software engineering. So it, it just really, really matched up nicely with what they were trying to do. And so I was really lucky that they came to recruit at a time when I had those skill sets to provide. And so, um, you know, it's kind of funny. A lot of people think that you you start over when you switch industries, but in reality, you're actually compounding these experiences into things that you can leverage. And to be honest, like just going from finance to starting, starting quote unquote, starting over from scratch allowed me to get into Ripple. And so, um, that's something to really like, you know, remember is that none of your experiences in your life are wasted. They're all, it all compounds and comes back to you at some point. Um, and so, yeah, I did the ripple thing for, um, you know, a year and a half. So I joined ripple in 2014, March, which is really early on. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, so Ethereum was not even around then and Vitalik actually visited our offices and like, this is before he even launched it. And like, so I was surrounded by these like crazy people in crypto. Um, and I was just like a entry level software engineer there. And it was an amazing experience to learn and just, just be in the hub of all this new wave, right. Of crypto. So, um, that was a crazy time. Uh, and then I guess 2015, I had the the essentially like our team was stopped from progressing any further because of financial regulations. And so obviously we're not even close to getting out of the financial what is it like uh like not like it's not clear whether where crypto regulation is going still right which is crazy but um yeah. when I was leaving that was when it started to kind of like you know, the regulators were like, all right, something's happening here. We better crack down on it. And so when that happened, like, I knew my days there were numbered because I'm someone that always likes to move forward. I need to be moving forward or else I just go crazy. And so, um, yeah, I left uh, September 2015 and started uh, Urban EDC, which is my first uh, e-commerce company. So, yeah. Awesome. And there's two things that you highlighted there that I want to go back to and talk through. One, what was it like going full circle? I mean, you were on a trade desk in New York City. Yeah. Now you're living on a, you were living on a couch or an air mattress and are now an intern mm -hmm. at a company. Um, and then also you mentioned you always knew that you wanted to be on the starting the business side, building a business side. Where do you think that came from? So ever since I was, I was little, I always knew that I was going to start a business one day. And I don't know where that comes from, Andreas, but I was so driven, even when I was a young kid, that, um, you know, I always saw the bigger picture of what I was doing. So even when I was at, for example, like I was at a trading firm, but in the back of my mind, my vision at that time for my future was to start my own hedge fund one day. So it, it wasn't a tech company, but it was still a company that I was going to start eventually. And so yeah. when I was going to these, uh, you know, I had essentially I had two jobs in New York City, both uh, trading companies. And I wasn't just going there and clocking in and out, like just doing my work and, you know, whatever. I was actually just absorbing everything I can. And so I was looking at compliance, like, okay, how does the compliance team work? function along with the entire company okay how do these partners at these companies like what's their role like some of them were bringing in new business some of them were you know more operationally driven and so i was like just soaking up everything like a sponge not just from my own like job perspective but how the company was run because ultimately that what that was my goal is how do i run a company and so i had that lens even from an earlier stage of my life and so 
I think that's really important, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting on their own is like, you know, if you're at a job right now and, you know, you, let's say it's it's very comfortable, like it's up to you to go beyond that comfort zone and like just figure out like, okay, how do these pieces and these departments all connect and how does it all work together? And imagine you being the CEO of that company, like how would you run that, right? Because that's how I saw myself. Every opportunity I got is like, all right, I mean, even at Ripple, right? I was like, if I were running this company, what decisions would it be making right now? And like, how is that different from how it's being run now? Like I do these things constantly. And so I think that really like prepped me for kind of like getting on my, um, you know, starting on my own and, and all that. So. Yeah, no. And, and I think that's very relatable to a lot of people working that nine to five, but who have that side hustle passion. I, I fit into that category. I work a nine to five. It's an amazing company. I, I love what I do, but I constantly have to be building on the side. I started some companies in college, so I always have that itch still. And I'm always looking at different things like, hmm, I wonder if I would do it that way or like, interesting. I didn't know that's how a business unit at a company operates. I've never learned about compliance or I've never really learned about HR. So I think that's awesome. Your next jump, like you mentioned, was into e-commerce. It was Urban EDC. Did you have a passion for e-commerce or was that just naturally what became the business that you wanted to start because that was what was hot at the time? Yeah, so this is a good question. So what I did was I did an exercise that I encourage all your listeners to do, which is like go grab your credit card statements and see what you spend money on. Because like, you know, you earn money, your precious, you know, whatever um, paycheck that you get every two weeks, and you're spending it on on stuff. And like, usually it's more about, um, you know, obviously you got your like groceries and utilities, which are like necessary. But then you have like other things you 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 buy that isn't really necessary to live, right? Um, and so for me, it was like, you know, like titanium pens or these like, you know, well machined pocket tops. Um, and, and things like that. And I was like, all right, this is pretty interesting. Like I was seeing a consistent pattern and I was like, how do I leverage this hobby that I have into a business? And this concept of like using your hobby and starting a business from that. And so that you turn your personal cost center into a profit center. Like this is something that, uh, is kind of a, a revolutionary idea that, that, uh, a lot of people I think should think about is like, what are your personal cost centers and how do and how do you turn those into profit centers for yourself by starting a business around it and so that's how i got into uh you know everyday carry gear in general uh the the e-commerce portion of it was um you know i recognized that the trend at the time was selling on amazon but it was starting to shift into more of the brand stuff with shopify and so I thought, okay, well, let me get ahead of the curve here and I'll just start directly on Shopify. I won't even get on Amazon and then um, just build my brand that way. And so uh, that's exactly what I did is, is you know, I, I started from scratch. Actually, what I did also is, is I, I bought stuff off of Amazon to resell, to test the theory that a shop dedicated to everyday carry gear would resonate with the audience that I had built. And so um, I encourage this as well. It's like, don't spend too much money on, on things without testing. And so always be testing things. And so when, you know, people just bought stuff off of the Amazon, I, I wasn't making any money, by the way. I was just reselling it at the same price. Um, but it was a way to test it, right? So um, the e-commerce stuff was, I guess it was a little bit trendy, you would say. Uh, but it wasn't... I don't know. That was just the opportunity that was there at the time. And so obviously the landscape has changed now. I would say commerce is probably way more uh, crowded now. And, and um, but that was the opportunity at the time. And like just being able to buy the things that I loved at wholesale cost, like 50% off, like that was just like a kind of, kind of a fun thing for me. It's like, oh, I can buy all of this stuff that I already buy, but, you know, at wholesale cost, which is kind of cool. So, yeah. And just for people listening, what is everyday carry gear? I know 
the main portion of the sales were pocket knives, yeah. but what does yeah. that category have in it? Yeah, so the general premise is that um, you know, every single person has an everyday carry, whether they like it or not. It's the stuff that you carry on a daily basis. So like you mm. probably have a wallet, you probably have uh, you know, maybe a pen that you carry around with you. Um, you know, I always have a bottle opener that I carry on me. Uh, you, you carry your keys, and so you might have some keychain tools with you. Like I have a uh, a flashlight that attaches to my keychain uh, for those like emergencies when you like drop something in the movie theater and you're trying to look for it in the dark, like things like that. Um, and so everybody has an everyday carry, uh, but. I guess it kind of depends on, you know, what line of work you work in also. And so um, what people love doing is they like to just take everything out of their pockets and just take a photo of it. And they'll say, oh, you know, I'm uh, I work as a firefighter. Um, and so like that person's EDC gear, because they're a firefighter, is going to be way different from like a student who is just works on their computer all day. So that's kind of the culture of, of the community is like showing off what's in your pockets. Um, but then what evolved from that is like people were sh sharing what's in their pockets, but then people started carrying some like really cool stuff and like really hard to find stuff. And it was like interesting. And so people were like, where can I buy this? And it turns out like that item is very limited and really hard to find and buy. And so that this created this kind of like, you know you're familiar with like supreme right or the drop model yep um so th this created a frenzy every time a maker high in demand maker would create like a batch of 10 i don't know like bottle openers um it would sell out instantly or there'll be a wait list or a lottery uh and so that kind of culture evolved from people taking pictures of their everyday carry items but then just like the art and creativity in the community just like just rose to the top where now people are trying to get these really rare items that are like really hard to find and that was kind of the fun part of the fun of it is like i've been wanting to get this thing i can never get it and then one day you get it and you're, oh, you're like oh my god like i finally got it and you have a cool story to tell right so that's kind of the culture of everyday carry okay yeah and i i had a i was Love shoes. One of those kids that first business was flipping sneakers, um, and and I I totally can empathize with that. The hunt for that shoe. The yeah, yeah. how am I going to get it? Where am I going to find it? Going store to store, website to website. So I could see how that would build this brand. Until doing my homework and research on you, I didn't know there was a a pocket knife community around this or a, a knife community around this that there. You, even in other episodes that you've been on where I was listening, there's like an art aspect to all of this. Mm -hmm. Did you like the, like, was an everyday carry thing a pocket knife for you? Or did that just organically become a big part of the website through people asking for it? Yeah, so I actually launched the shop without knives on it because I was not a, a knife guy. You know, I've, I've never, I had never been a big outdoors person. Um, you know, I, I, Knives weren't a big part of who I was, but then talking to customers, they're like, you can't have an everyday carry shop without pocket knives. It is literally, you build your everyday carry around your pocket knife, right? So once I got that feedback, I was like, all right, let's, you know, let's start offering some pocket knives. But then I got into it and, and like, it's a really addictive I guess, uh, hobby and expensive. Uh, some of these custom knives can be like over a thousand dollars and you can't even buy, you have to get on a, a lotto and, and a wait list to get these thousand dollar knives. It's crazy. Um, but the artistry, it's like, it's like a collecting, you know, paint, like, like art that you display. Like people don't actually use these knives. They're almost like, they're almost like toys that are for like people grown, grown up, people who have tons of disposable income they're it's it's they're just like expensive toys uh and they just like put them in their little little collection and they take them out once in a while to play with it and then they put it back and that's it like they never use them um so there is definitely that art element to it okay yeah and e-commerce obviously provided you 
a very fruitful journey as the website started to take off, revenue started to fly in. Then you bought a French bulldog and all of a sudden became the dad of a celebrity dog yeah. and parlayed that into an e-com like opportunity. Talk through that. Yeah. So uh, my wife and I brought home a French bulldog. Uh, this is in 2017. And obviously we had, we, we had no plans of, of getting him into celebrity <laughs> status. Right. Uh, um, but we just, well, first of all, like he, he does have a really like cute personality and he's a good looking French bulldog. Like I'm biased, but I, he is a good, like he is a very good looking French bulldog. Um, and so we got him and this is right on the time when Instagram videos were starting to pop off. So Instagram was transitioning from a photo visual platform to more of like a video platform. And so we started posting a lot of his like really cute videos and and like a lot of them just popped like millions of views. And so that's how we grew uh, Humphrey's Instagram following, which is just, just through these like crazy videos. And this is like, I think one, one lesson here is like, know what, what the platform is trying to do. And you can ride that wave if you if you kind of like get in there early and you and you ride whatever they're trying to push out, right? And so, um, so yeah, that happened. And, and so now, you know, we decided to launch um, a boutique online uh, a dog shop called Spotted by Humphrey, which is play on word of his Instagram handle, Spotted Humphrey. And yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially the same business except the front end website is different. The operations are pretty much exactly the same right and the audiences are obviously very different but um the back end stuff is all the same and so it was it was a lot easier and my, and my wife manages that by the way and so um you know we just thought hey like why don't we just do this same playbook for urban edc but let's do it for for dog owners and so that's kind of how um spot up humphrey was born i mean what, what, a, what a great story and and just a cool way to have a business be created um, something that I forgot to ask with the first business, mm -hmm. but it, it fits in here perfect is, are you holding all of this inventory? Are you partnering with other companies to put the inventory on your website? How do, how, how does that work? Yeah. So we have all the inventory. So we buy the inventory and then we have uh, a warehouse that we store everything in. And so that's actually another uh, good example here, which is um, when, when I launched Urban ADC, I was very particular about the type of product that we wanted. And so a couple of things that I had in mind were like, it's going to be small. I wanted, I wanted it to be high value. Um, and then I also didn't want it to be electronics because electronics can, can break easily. Yeah. And there's a lot of QC issues. And so we... Essentially, we launched a shop with with the, with the idea that these are things that are metal, relatively light. Oh yeah, the weight is another thing. We want it to make to, to to be light, and so um, our footprint in a warehouse is very small. And so we actually started off in a it's like a facility that was almost like a WeWork for e commerce startups, um, but it was very very like not fancy. It was very it, to be honest, it was it's a self storage facility that happened to have Wi-Fi and we were just piggybacking off of their Wi-Fi. It was very rough, but all of these companies were in this building working together and they saw what we were doing. Cause we had a, you know, a unit in here and actually this, this parlays really well into the next company. Um, but they were asking us, Hey, who's doing your fulfillment? Because like our fulfillment is the biggest pain point of our operations. And like, Every e-commerce business owner you, you talk to will tell you that fulfillment is, is a huge headache. And so we decided to um, bring fulfillment in-house because we were using a 3PL before, but we had a lot of issues with a 3PL. And so we decided to bring it in-house. And then we had all these brands asking us to help them with their fulfillment. And so we started taking on private clients. And so we actually had paying clients before we even had a website, a logo, or a company name. Like we didn't even have a name and we, we were getting paid. And so we knew there was something here. And so we decided to double down on that and uh, create the third company called uh, Growth Jet. And so um, Growth Jet is a climate neutral certified 3PL uh, for you know, emerging you know, large volume brands. 
and uh yeah we just moved into a thirty nine thousand square foot warehouse and um that wow. is rolling yeah so and that's super exciting and i know logistics and fulfillment is is definitely the biggest headache when it comes to e-commerce especially if you're doing work overseas i have a, I have a buddy now who's just started a company a year ago um, in cigars and all of his tubes and boxes and everything are being made overseas. And he's really got to figure out when to order things because it could take a month, a month and a half for it to actually get here unless you want to pay an arm and a leg. And then something else, explain what a 3PL is for people listening or yeah. watching that don't know. Um, and I think that'll add some context to the the company name and everything yeah so it's a 3pl stands for third party logistics and essentially you you hire a service instead of doing all the shipping yourself you hire a service to store your items and then when the orders come through your website uh, the service will go around the warehouse pick your items pack them and then scan them all into a, a package and then ship it out using the best, uh, you know, shipping rates available. So it seems very simple, Andreas, when you when I talk to you about this, but it is it is a operational Tetris because you're getting orders from all different types of people and brands. And your job is to prioritize what's important and what's not imp what everything's important. But, you know, which one should go out first, yeah. which ones can wait. And so it is it is an operational Tetris that you're playing on a on a daily basis um, to get all the orders out on time. Yeah. Thank you all for listening to this podcast. Just wanted to take a quick second to give a shout out to Micromedia. Micromedia is the company that I use to essentially create this podcast that you all are consuming right now. They handle my long form editing and my short form editing. I would be pressed to find anybody that's doing better short form than we are here at virtual ventures and micromedia is the company that's making that happen so feel free to reach out to me i can put you in contact with them if that's something you're interested in um and enjoy the rest of the show yeah no uh, and i i didn't i didn't know too much about 3pls until starting to do some homework and i was i was reading through a lot of it and I mean, I, I could see how it could just be insane. <laughs> You're getting orders from eight different companies and 20 different SKUs and to 30 different states and, and locations. And I mean, I I couldn't think of a a, a harder business just off of a, like logistical standpoint and prioritizing your time and what's more important and what's not, like you said. So, and, and I, I like how like all of these businesses tie into each other. Um, yeah. They all like organically, like e I feel like it's funny. You started the e-commerce company about something you were passionate about. Next thing you, I guess, let's say got lucky and your dog went viral, already had the e-com <laughs> background. So naturally started an e-commerce company on top of that. And then through building both of those companies, you're getting really good at the logistics, the fulfillment of these companies. Other people are catching on. You're like, oh, I already know that. Built another business on top of that. So, I mean, it's just a beautiful, natural progression. And you're, you're staying in a lane that you're comfortable in, that you know you can win into, which I think is really important. Um, you own two e-commerce sites. You are the dad of a celebrity dog. You own a fulfillment company and you write a newsletter where do you find time to do all of these different things and how do you ensure that you're delivering the best possible product across the board when you're stretched thin great great question i get asked this question probably more than any other question and so the key here is that you have to find amazing people to work with and i think a lot of entrepreneurs are really you know, they, they see the solopreneur lifestyle being sold to them, like work, work whenever you want. And four hours a day, go out for a walk at 1 p.m., go grab a drink with your wife at, I don't know, 3 p.m. Like these are like, these are great, right? But then you're still doing the work yourself. Even even if you hire freelancers yeah. or, or virtual assistants, like you have to check all of their work and they don't care really about 
your long-term success because they're paid on a monthly basis or whatever agreement you have. So they only care about, okay, am I delivering the deliverables and is he going to be happy with it? And then you, ch- you have to check it yourself. And so it's, it's so much different than, than having, working with an employee who is vested in, you know, in your company, who understands what's happening, the moving pieces, and can make decisions on behalf of your company. And so that's really the key is like, I'll tell you right now, Andrea, it's like uh, GrowthJet, the company, the, the third one that I started. I actually today I've I haven't I didn't speak to uh our general manager at once today. I think I spoke to him yet yesterday. He told me he needed some palette wrap, so I like ordered some palette wrap for him. That's it. Like this is how hands off we are. And the key is like you have to find really good people though cuz like we tried other general managers um for growth jet in the past and they're you know I try to train them up to a certain point but uh, the fit really has to be there. And so, you know, they have to understand P&L. They've got to understand cost, how to manage it. Uh, so it's not an easy position to fill. But um, the key is to find general managers who really care about your business and incentivize the, the structure, the, the pay structure in a way where, you know, they're getting paid for performance and for the company to do well. And that way, like it frees you up to do a lot of other stuff. And so to be honest, like, like last year at some point, I, I felt like I was like almost like retired. It was a really weird feeling, but like, (laughs) I wasn't working on the business at all. Like I was telling my wife, I was like, Hey, I feel like I'm like almost like retired because I'm not really like I could, I just work whenever I want. I don't really do anything. And so I don't know, like all last year, it was like, I just felt like I wasn't doing anything. So I got bored and I was like, I gotta, I gotta work on something else. (laughs) And so that's kind of why I started a a podcast, uh, first class founders, and then incorporated the newsletter on top of that. So newsletter and podcast, um, that I launched November of last year. It's been almost a year now. Um, but I've been being more active now on social. So I'm pretty big on X slash Twitter, um, sharing my journey with other people. Um, and really, this the philosophy that I want to spread is this idea of a personal holding company, which we can get into if you want, Andreas. Yeah. But essentially, it's, it's this idea that, uh, you know, there's like a new path to building a business uh, that's neither, you know, you don't have to... St- do a business that you're you're kind of stuck in, which is like the solopreneur model, I think is, is a good one where like you're working on it and you have clients, you're paying clients. And like traditional solopreneur playbook is like, okay, you have some experience, you leverage that, you grow an audience, you, you know, just write content about it. And then you start getting paid clients and then your business grows um, through your paid clients, like your, yourself. But then you're still working like you're limit you're limited on your growth because you're the yeah. one that has to do all the work. And so there's like that path. But then the personal holding co path is like, you know, you have all these hobbies that 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 everyone has. Like I had I love pocket knives now and like EDC gear. So I started a business around that. Our French Bulldog somehow got famous. Um and we launched a, a dog shop based on his, you know, using his audience. And, um, you know, that's a big part of who we are now. And it's so fun because we get to take our dogs everywhere and um, we get invited to these five-star hotels. All we have to do is like post content about it. And like, it's like these life experiences that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have this famous (laughs) French bulldog. Um, (laughs) And then growth jet is, you know, a need that we had a cost center in our business, right? A shipping business. Um, and so we we turn that into a profit center within our business. And what's key about that, Andreas, is that I'm using the shipping because the shipping labels are pass through, right? So, you know, we pay the shipping labels and then we charge our our, our clients uh, for the shipping labels, shipping costs. And so what's great is that um, I'm getting credit card rewards from those shipping labels. And so I rack up a ton of credit card cash back. And so I actually live off of that cash back. And so it's crazy, but like, like my expenses, like I'd say 90% of it goes through my credit card. And so that essentially is like, 
I almost consider it, I don't want to say dividend because then it's, I want to classify this correctly, but it almost feels like I'm just, you know, I'm taking money out from the business where it's in the form of a credit card cash back, which is not taxable. And so it's tax free and I'm able to like have, enjoy the lifestyle that I enjoy um, without having to really pay myself a large salary. Uh, and so this personal holding company idea is one that, you know, I call, consider it lifestyle business on steroids. It's almost like lifestyle business 2.0, where you don't have to just do one thing. You can do multiple things and you just have to, you know, hire well and hire a GM who could essentially take that off of your plate. And then you can, you're free to kind of work on other stuff. So many nuggets of, of things I want to dive into there. First, we'll start with what we were talking about originally. You're hiring these individuals to come and run these businesses. And I know you had a story. I don't know if it's the holding company's general manager or one of the specific companies, but you had a customer service rep go all the way up to becoming a general manager for you. What criteria as the CEO or business owner, what criteria are you looking for when you're hiring? What are some things that stand out to you as like, this is what I'm looking for in my perfect candidate? Yeah, th this is the million dollar question, right? Because it's really not easy finding uh, an operator that you can, A, trust, and B, be, you know, uh, efficient, or I guess, um, be good at it, right? So it's, it's really an art to this. And so what what helps me a lot is, is I just work with the person a lot. And so um, you know, I train them. I, I I analyze their decision making. I make sure they have all the tools they need, but I don't force them to do anything. I I, I look to see if they have the inner drive to push forward with, by themselves. Like I don't want to be the one being like, hey, like, you know, did you do this? Did you do this? Like, why didn't you do this? Like, I don't want to be that kind of manager. And so the manager that I want to be is here are all the tools that you need go build your, you know, go build whatever you need to build. And if you need anything else, just let me know. I'm happy to help. Sometimes I might push back on it. Like if they want something crazy expensive, I might be like, okay, instead of getting this, why don't we try this alternative? Like I might, you know, brainstorm here and there. But the idea is that you want someone who is like entrepreneurial in nature. And so it's actually quite difficult because if they're entrepreneurial, then they want to start on their own. But then uh, you have to find someone who is like really, I guess, um, loyal to you and they want to learn from you. And the key is that you have to be the mentor for them to stay on with you. And so the moment they consider themselves either more advanced or more knowledgeable than you, then you start to have problems. And so I, I did have a problem before where um, I had a previous general manager of, of GrowthJet he sent out an email to all of our clients being like, Hey, uh, by the way, this company is now shut down. I'm starting my own company. And now you're part of my own, my company. And so like, I was like freaking out because literally like, so essentially a general manager went rogue on me. Um, and I had to fix that issue and, and thankfully no one left. And so it was kind of embarrassing to be honest for that other general manager, but, uh, ex general manager, but, um, he thought that he was better than I was. And he, he literally called me over and said, um, you're just a financier. I'm the brains behind this operation. That was a quote that he told me. And I'll never forget that because that, that to this day is like, I think about that. I'm like, all right, the fact that he even said that in that statement means that he thought he knew way more about business than me. And so the moment that happens, your gen your general manager is is going to start thinking about either leaving or just going rogue like this guy did. Um, so you have to level up. So I'm I'm always trying to level up my my game. And so I'm reading like crazy, like you know, listening to podcasts, whatever. Like I'm always improving myself and connecting with other people. Uh, and, and so that way. No one can out, you know, no one can beat me in, in terms of like my, my acceleration of like, you know, where I am. And like, if they do, then that's like amazing. But like, I, I need to be 
above of essentially like I want, I need to be aspirational to these general managers or else they're not going to have a, a reason to st- to stay right so yeah no i think it's it's really important to highlight there's plenty of bad leaders in the world and if you work in corporate america i can guarantee you probably had a bad boss in your life the best leaders are the ones that treat leadership like a mentorship program and invest in their talent, invest in their individuals. But then again, which is the point I want to highlight, that doesn't mean you as the leader get to slack off because you are the one teaching them because the mentee will become the mentor if you don't continue to learn. So it's kind of that perfect balance. It's like, I'm going to go empower this individual, teach them, coach them so that I can succeed. But also now I have a great reason to continue to push myself as an individual to get better, continue to learn and to stay on top of things. So, I mean, that's perfect. Personal holding companies, like we had mentioned, it's definitely something I want to dive into. You're building somewhat of a personal brand around it on X, like you mentioned. Um, You're doing a great job because I've been seeing the content much more. Um, Explain what a personal holding company is for people who have never heard of that explain the difference between personal holding versus a regular holding company and then maybe just talk through some of the advantages yeah absolutely so personal holding company essentially is a company that holds other companies underneath it and so there's a lot of reasons why you would do this um from an entity structure you could form like llcs for example and that'll protect you from uh, liability issues so for example let's say you're running a laundromat You're running a restaurant and running a nail salon inside your personal holding company, right? Uh, In that scenario, like, let's say, God forbid, there is like an act, there's an injury at the nail salon where like something happens and uh, somebody gets injured. The customer that gets injured cannot sue you for more than what's in the LLC, which is like your nail salon LLC. And so, Uh, From a structural perspective, you want to have LLCs strategically in place so that you don't limit your exposure. Um, But then there's a lot of other benefits too. Like you can do, um, you know, you can do P&Ls for each of these businesses. You can keep, because you're keeping bank accounts separate and credit card statements separate. Um, You can also, um, you know, think about how each of these businesses fit into your overall portfolio that serves you. And so this is the biggest difference between a regular hold co and a personal hold co, which is um, a regular hold co generally is like, you know, you're, you're out there fundraising, you have shareholders, you have investors, and your job is to get the highest, you know, return on investment because, uh, you know, your, your job is to serve shareholders. And so you're out there just searching everywhere for the best deals and so you might come across uh like an hvac company or like a a scaffolding company that has really high margins and it's been around for 20 30 years and you know the owner is ready to retire uh and that might be a great acquisition for you because you're essentially like you know you're buying an amazing business and that's going to be great for your shareholders shareholders but then a personal hold co you know for me, like I have no interest in running or learning about HVAC companies or a scaffolding company. Uh, and so it doesn't serve me personally. And so if you look at each one of my companies that I have so far, Urban EDC came out of my own passion for everyday care gear. It was a hobby that I turned into a business. Spot up by Humphrey, you know, our French bulldog who also gets sponsorship deals, by the way. So he's like a, a creator. So like he gets a lot of uh, other deals too. Um, and so that's a lot of fun for us as a family, right? And so, um, you know, that's the second company growth jet, the third company, I wouldn't go in and ship everything out myself. Like I don't enjoy that process, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a very like cash flow, cash flowing business. And so that brings a lot of like credit card rewards and and things like that. And so it's really helpful, uh, for me because of that. And so it, it works together really well as a cohesive whole to serve me and my family. And so I think that's the biggest difference is like personal hold co you're serving yourself essentially. Whereas a whole a regular hold co is you're serving the investors and you're, and you're serving 
kind of the shareholders and you're trying to, you know, you know, raise more money or whatever it is. But a personal hold co is more like, it's almost like you're, you're optimizing for your own fulfillment and your own needs over everything else. So that's the biggest difference. Yeah. And, and what was it like finding out that there was a community or, or people interested in this topic? Because just reading through your tweets, when you talk about personal hold codes and, and your journey with that, they get a ton of engagement and a ton of um, like feedback. Did you think that that many people were interested in that? Or was it kind of a surprise to you? You know, what's funny, Andreas, is that I was talking and writing about everything that I'm telling you, right? Like about the dog business, you know, Airbnb, DC, but it wasn't, it didn't resonate with people because it's kind of random, right? Like, okay, who is this, who's this creator talking about selling pocket knives? Like, I, I don't have an e-commerce shop. Like, why would I care? But like, when I packaged it into this way of like, oh, I'm the distribution center. Like, I'm the, I'm the one that's like, you know, I've got different parts of my life. I've got a, a hobby, collecting pocket knives. I've got French Bulldogs. I've got, you know, all these parts of my life. And now I'm, I'm positioning myself as the centerpiece to these hobbies and interests. Like, when that happened, that was a big, like, unlock for a lot of people. And I think they realized that, okay, I also have this. Uh, and a lot of people are afraid of talking about their other interests online because it doesn't fit into their niche. They're like, this yeah. is what I'm teaching to other people. I can't talk about this other hobby that I have. And like, that's the feedback that I've constantly gotten is like, man, like I, I you know, I love fishing, but I can't talk about it because it makes no sense in the context of like the business stuff that I'm writing about. And and so a lot of people come to me and they're like, oh my God, you solved the problem for me. I was like, what do you mean? They're like, now I can talk about all of my interests in the in the context of a personal hold go. They're they like thank me. They're like, thank you so much. And I'm like, I didn't like I feel like I didn't do anything, but they're like, this is so interesting. Like I never thought about it that way, but like you're right. Like I can I can just position this as my as myself, and then all of these are different parts of myself rather than like focusing on one area. And then I can't talk about anything else because it doesn't fit into this one niche. Like that doesn't, it doesn't work that way with, with personal health codes. So um, yeah, a lot of people are, are, I think they're attracted to this idea because secretly they all have, or they want to have personal health codes, but they just don't know how to do it or, or just like structure it properly. So um, yeah, that's kind of, I think it's less a lot of, um, I guess, interest around the topic and how to actually do it properly. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's a very interesting way to think about it. It gives people an avenue to talk more about everything they have going on if it's under their personal hold co, which wraps in the business if they want that business aspect. Um, you've stated a few times that you're extremely interested in, in building a community and a network, even said yeah. a network that you didn't have early on. Where does that come from and why? Yeah, it's a great question. So. At one point in my career, I actually wanted to be anonymous. And so I wanted to be very wealthy, like successful from business and all that. But I wasn't ready to share and, you know, essentially be a target for people. And there's a lot of crazy people who will just come after you if you're a public figure, no matter what. Like you could be the nicest public figure in the world. They don't care. Like they're just so desperate that they'll come after you. And so I didn't really want that to happen. Uh, and so I was very private for, for a long time. Um, but then I just realized that in order for me to, you know, we talked about elevating myself, right? Continuously improving. In order for me to like have more leverage and be able to accelerate my journey as an entrepreneur, I needed to go out there. And so the positives of kind of like spreading my wings and seeing what catches, uh, it far outweighs the, the negative aspects of, of being a more of a public figure. And so when I made that realization, I mean, it's so true. Like I, you know, I've been online for about a year now publicly and it's crazy how many people I've met and, and, uh, it's, 
just been an amazing journey of, of meeting other like-minded people. Cause you know, if you're not public, then you only hang out with people around you, like your, your old friends and stuff. But then online, it's like fair game. You, you can meet people from all parts of the world and they share the, share the same vision as you. And like, you can talk to them and connect with them. And so that's, you know, really been, been a game changer for me personally is, is just meeting all these people, uh, that I would never have been able to meet if I didn't, um, you know, go public. So. Yeah. Yeah, And I, I can relate to you very heavily from that perspective. I built my first three companies all anonymously, all through a discord alias and they were amazing till they weren't. And all of the work in the community that I built was still there, but I didn't build a brand around it personally, so I couldn't take those to whatever I had to going on next. And that's my biggest regret. And being on the internet now for probably a year and a half, I've met hundreds of people that I would have never talked to. So if there's one action item I would give to people listening, don't be scared to, to, to put yourself out there online. You will meet so many amazing people who will change the trajectory of your life. And I think that's great, like action item for people listening or watching. And I know we're coming to the tail end of this. I'm going to ask that famous, simple question <laughs> of Young So, what are you excited about in the near future? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people are sleeping on on themselves to be honest with you like i feel like you know i didn't realize the opportunities that were hidden they're literally hidden before me until i started just publishing online and, and getting in front of other people and i just i just feel like this is just the beginning um i think that the term creator will no longer exist in 10 years because I think everybody is going to be a creator at some point. And so, you know, this idea, this notion that, um, oh, I'm a content creator. Like, no, like that, that's going to go away, like in my perspective. So everyone is going to be a creator to some extent. Like you could, you know, obviously there's like amazing creators, like mediocre creators or whatever. But um, I just feel like the world is getting more and more connected you know, everything's being democratized, like people all over the world can talk to other people from every single corner of the, uh, of the world, right? And that level of access has never happened before, never. And so someone who's living in a, you know, a poor town in, in, in um, some country where, you know, internet access might be really spotty, if they can get on the internet and start building a personal brand and like reaching out to other entrepreneurs, like I've talked to so many entrepreneurs who are like, you know, they're, they're from other, they're not from the U S they're just, you know, their, their, their infrastructure for entrepreneurship is very, very like, it's no long, it's not existent in their countries, but because they're able to connect with other entrepreneurs and learn from them, it's like, now they have a support system. They actually have some kind of like infrastructure to like plug into. And I feel like this is a, a huge trend that will only continue to build. And so I'm excited just for humanity as a whole. Like, I just feel like everyone, there's like no excuses anymore. Like the cost of starting a company is near zero now. Cost of building an audience is essentially zero. I mean, there are no excuses and, and we're going to see a lot of crazy people entrepreneurs that we've never heard of coming from countries that we can't even imagine and this is going to happen in the next you know 10 15 years and uh I, i'm like really excited to be a part of that i am right there with you i have the same feelings about the internet and the world we live in right now and i am so bullish on individuals over the next 10 to 15 years it's a completely fair playing field once the internet is involved. Everybody has access to all of these amazing resources. And I hope that the digital divide in the world continues to close and that everybody in the world gets access to internet because you're going to see some dangerously hungry individuals coming from that. Where can people connect totally with agree. you? 
we, we've had an amazing conversation here. I want people to be able to go from this, connect with you, talk with you, follow you. Where's the best place for them to do that? Yeah. So um, my podcast and newsletter is at firstclassfounders.com. And actually, the, the episode that I think your audience would really enjoy is um, episode 25. So firstclassfounders.com slash 25. And that episode is specifically about how to build a side hustle into a million dollar awesome. um, business as a creator. And I feel like that's something that um, it's essentially what I did to to build when I was earlier in, in, in my journey. And so I feel like that'd be a great episode for your audience. Awesome. All of Young So's stuff will be linked in the description below. It's been an absolute pleasure. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm happy we were able to connect. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to follow your journey from a more personal view now. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, I had a great time here today. And I'm uh, thankful that you invited me. Awesome.